So thank you everybody for being here. Um, my name is Dan Narkevich. Um, I'm a Drupal developer, and I'm the director of technology at one of the conference's sponsors, Mabama. Um, I'm here today to introduce Frederick Mitchell, who's an electrical engineer turned Acquia certified backend developer and a 15-year Drupal veteran. Frederick's passion for openness, diversity, inclusiveness, and especially human-centered design has made him a recognizable leader in the community. He has spoken at Drupal conferences and camps around the world, recently in Denver, Portland, Idaho, and Minneapolis. He maintains a multitude of public projects, including the State Machine Module, and he's the founder of a small Drupal development agency, Bright Plum, where he's worked with the American Hospital Association and the Office of Justice. The first time I met Frederick, it was evident to me that he had a passion for analyzing and understanding complex systems. It's a passion that drove him to study both Coulomb's laws and the Drupal community which he truly, honestly enjoys. Frederick believes that human-centered reasoning is all about people, and that one must truly place oneself into the experience of others in order to solve the problems they encounter. He believes that we, as developers, have a responsibility to build an empathetic and inclusive community around our tools, and that we have a unique chance to address the diversity problem in engineering by having our community stand for both good technology and good people. Frederick's obvious and infectious enthusiasm for Drupal is just as strong today as it was when he first began solutioning in Drupal 5. Since then, the community has been developing around this core idea of paying attention to other people's needs. Frederick knows that in such a growing community, openness, diversity, and inclusiveness are essential components for creating long-lasting innovations and successes. He knows that we as individuals have a desire to connect with others who share different perspectives while still enjoying our own journey. He knows that even in a world with pandemics, remote work, and political differences, we can get into a mindset where we allow ourselves to enjoy solving problems together with other people. And that is the essence of an open source community, that ultimately different technologies can bring people together and lead to human connection. So now, let's welcome Frederick. Good morning, how are y'all doing? Whoa, oh, sorry. Maybe I don't need a mic. <laughs> Good morning, how are y'all doing? Awesome. First of all, Dan wrote that introduction, so that was amazing, so thank you very much, man. That was, that was, that was great. I really appreciate that. All right, so yeah, as Dan said, uh, my name is Frederick Mitchell. I've been part of the Drupal community for a really long time, 15 plus years. Um, you know, I've been at a lot of different places and work with all different kind of organizations, federal, state, nonprofit, corporate, universities, etc. Um, I've actually been doing this talk, and oh, let me quick, quick poll. Has anyone seen me sort of do, a, do this talk before at other places? A few people? Okay, cool. That's great. No, so you're all new. That, that's awesome. So anyway, if you actually Google some of the words on this talk, you'll actually see the presentation come up like seven times. <laughs> Um, and what's really cool about it is um, it's, it's grown and changed based on the experiences that I've had and the feedback that I've gotten over time, so this is no different. So hopefully, you know, we can kind of get into it. Um, the original kind of premise of this talk was really sort of focused on, I guess, convincing our community that diversity was good. It really kind of went into like this math and science sort of thing and use the Star Trek thing as, as a way to say like, hey, this is a good thing. That's not what this is anymore. I've, I've sort of moved on from that. I'm sort of at the space now, been in this industry for so long that if you want to argue about whether diversity is good, like you can do that online, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> wherever you decide to argue with it. The, 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 why I've sort of framed this is more of, okay, what do we do with it, and how do I more to think about it, and how do, what does that mean as part of this community, whether I'm using Drupal, whether I'm programming in Drupal, or whether I'm working with people who are using it. That's sort of the framing here, so. So let's get into it. Um, these slides are online, as my, all, all of my slides, so if you all ever want these slides, or, and I think this, this, um, this technology, slides.com, it'll actually like, you know, slide with me as I'm sort of going. If anyone wants to do that, that's fine. Um, I put the link at the end as well, so um, if you don't capture it now. But if you want the slides, this is where they are. And I apologize for the mic thing. I'm trying to figure out the good distance. <laughs> All right, so let's address the elephant in the room first, which is the main feedback I get every single time I do this talk. 
Why Star Trek Voyager? <laughs> For those who don't know, there's a lot of Star Treks. There's Star Trek Deep Space Nine, The Next Generation, the new one that just came out, Patrick Stewart. There's a new one, new one that's even... So why Star Trek Voyager? And some people have very strong opinions about that. So let me answer that question, you know, at the top. The first is you have to understand the premise of Star Trek Voyager. And basically the premise of Voyager, specifically within this series, was it's set within a setting that you have, I guess, the good guys, the people who are part of you know, um, Earth and are trying to promote the values of um, what is happening in the universe across the galaxy, and then you have rebels. And essentially what happens is, is that at the beginning of the show, the people who wear the uniform and the people who are rebelling against the people who are wearing the uniform somehow get thrust together 70,000 light years away from Earth, and they have to figure out how to get back. So if you think about that, you now have this basically situation in seven seasons of different people from different perspectives with literally who wanted were killing each other, <laughs> right? and now they have to work together to achieve a common goal. So the reason why I chose Star Trek Voyager in trying to talk about these ideas is for that premise, this idea that all of our lived experiences, all of our different perspectives, we're all trying to go in a, in a certain direction. Some of us may disagree vehemently about a lot of different things, but when it comes to collaborating and efficiently kind of coming together, right, there's a lot of nuances there that make that better, that are pitfalls, things of that nature. And so the allegory of this show sort of encompasses that, plus nerds like Star Trek, and I know sometimes when I do talks and I put diversity in the title, it's like, oh, okay, I don't want to talk about diversity, but then if I put Star Trek, like, oh, I want to go, and then they want to argue with me. So I try to do those two things together, right? The second reason why I put Star Trek Voyager is because when it came on when I was in, I don't know, middle school, uh, Tuvok, who was a black Vulcan, uh, for those who don't know about the Vulcan race, the Vulcan race is, was a race within the show that really, really focused on logic, right? So that's Spock, that's, that's others. In this case, this show sh showcased a black Vulcan. And around that time, most of the characters on TV, especially black characters, really had certain archetypes. They were either angry, or they were villains, or they, you know, were angry. <laughs> Right, Jordy LaForge in, in Next Generation kind of broke that mold a little bit, and obviously a lot of characters, you know, who were black in the, in the series, you know, broke a little bit of that mold. But Tuvok was very, very special to me just because of just the concepts of what the Vulcan ideology was, and then what he represented as a person. So um, that's another reason why I picked Star Trek Voyager. And then the other reason why um, I picked Voyager was because it was one of the first shows to have a female lead. So within the science fiction community at that time, having like a female lead, a female captain. I mean, I was too young to really understand all the politics, but at the, apparently it was controversial. I don't know. But anyway, and so the conversations and the history and the reasons why, if you actually do a little bit of Googling, kind of get some background on how they kind of came to decisions, it's really, really fascinating. And Kate Mulgrew kind of, you know, yes, she's probably, well, at the time, she was known for Orange is the New Black. I don't know what she's known for now, but at that time, she was Captain Jane Way, and that was really cool at the time. So that's the reason why I picked Voyager. So if anyone has any questions, about why I picked Star Trek Voyager, because I get this all the time. You can tell them all those reasons I just gave you. <laughs> all right, so let's get into the meat of the talk, and let's start with a few definitions first. First, let's talk about why I throw diversity out there. What does it actually mean, right? So we kind of have, I'm gonna really just talk about kind of three different types, right? So we have um, demographic diversity, right? So this is the stuff we all sort of know, gender, race, um, orientation, et cetera, right? Their identities, how we choose to represent ourselves in our life, right? We have experiential diversity, right? And that's what our experiences, what our affinities, our hobbies, those things are sort of more organic forming. Um, they complement sort of, you know, what we, what, how we identify each other and how we identify ourselves, right? And then you have, you know, cognitive, right? How we approach problems, how do we think about things? What are those ideologies that we have and we aspire to try to achieve certain goals? And that's usually, right, based on our experiences, and they all sort of, you know, kind of, again, kind of link toward each other. It's not a single thing, they're not separate, it's more of just sort of how to think about the concept in general. And they're all really fluid, right? Um, they're complex, and I think the part that makes us the most difficult, especially as human beings, is we also sort of get into this trap, right, bias. And if we just think about the technical definition of bias, 
What we're really talking about is the shortcuts our brains do to just make sense of things, right? We want to take shortcuts to really understand stuff so that we can process it quickly and kind of move forward. So the first thing our brain sort of does is this thing called thinking fast. Um, that sort of one side of your brain uses that fight or flight response and to pa you're, basically you're making a guess. If I see something, if I read something, if I interact with something and I don't really know what's going on, I'm going to try to take the information that I sort of see or guess or the context clues and, and make a quick judgment. But at the same time, you have the other side of your brain which is thinking slow, which is okay, based on that initial guess, how do I pull more things out of it? What is my personality? How do I, what are the things that I'm doing to try to get a little bit more details on that, right? Use institutional knowledge. You use you know, other things that you've experienced in your life to kind of course correct that guess. And this all kind of happens very, very rapidly, right? So we have this very complex layered thing of how we identify ourselves individually and that cacophony of all those different people very, based on the definition of diversity, right? Have that part. You have this thing in our brain where we're trying to assess you know, in a meeting, in a high stress situation towards a particular goal, trying to understand a concept, you have this bias thing where you're like, okay, I think I understand, or I think I know what that person's talking about, or I don't really know if I feel comfortable with that, but then you try to course correct, right, based on your experiences and things that you've engaged with to see, okay, do I understand this or do I not? Does that make sense? Everyone following me so far in terms of the definitions? Cool. All right. So one of the ways that is often recommended and think that I'm going to reinforce multiple times in this talk is, okay, what we're really talking about is sort of how to think, and, and the way that's sort of framed is something called mental models, right? Mental models are one way to put the ideas and things that you have and how you make decisions in context. It's a way to apply them, right, in all your different interactions, and especially within our open source community within Drupal, whether we are working on a module, whether we're mentoring someone, again, whether we're trying to solve a bug, whether we're trying to have a meeting about a thing to understand what a customer is asking for, or a client asks for, or a teammate asks for, or someone who's ultimately affected by that bug is asking for, right? Um, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do I make decisions? How do we make decisions to ultimately get to that solution? It's not really about you know, what you should do or convincing anyone that they're a bad person or you know, feeling that you're a bad person. The idea behind these mental models is, again, to kind of give you some ways to sort of think. So the first one is called inversion. And basically what that means is that instead of kind of starting with this idea of prove me wrong, right, that you come in with a particular idea, you start with what am I missing? You invert the question. So if you think you know and you're trying to figure things out and maybe you see something in, within your team or within your initiative or what have you, you invert the question and start thinking, okay, Obviously there's a disconnect here. Instead of trying to keep saying what you keep saying, keep saying and, and get that person to basically blunt every particular idea that you have, maybe start with the idea of inverted and say, what am I missing about this particular situation? The other mental model is something called um, the map is not the territory. And basically what that means is that whatever understanding you have, whatever understanding the other person has, whatever understanding that exists, there will always be flaws and nuance. Always. And if you keep that in mind, then you, it makes the first part a little bit easier because then you start thinking, okay, there's always going to be something that's not clear. And if I go into that with that assumption, then I can take the actions to sort of break that down. And in an open source community, when you again have so many diverse people, experiences, perspectives, and we already know that inside of our brain, we want to make shortcuts, right? This particular mental model helps us sort of check ourselves and comes, and comes into different situations with an open mind. And the last mental model that I just want to kind of throw out there is something called um, the circle of competence. And basically what that means is that what you've already experienced and the things that you've already done, right, you're going to use that as a shortcut to define whatever it is you're interacting with. And ultimately what that, what that does is that it creates a habit of trying to reinforce the things you already know, and therefore you put pressure on yourself to say, okay, am I right? Was my initial assumption correct? And if you don't feel right, then the emotions start to set in. And what I'm sort of throwing out there, especially again within our open source, all these different ideas we're talking about, you sort of ask your question, okay, is the goal to be right, or is the goal to be successful? Because sometimes when you're trying to get to success, right, you may have to Ask yourself the first question, what am I missing? You guys still with me? I know it's the morning time. I'll try to, try to pick up the energy a little bit. <laughs> All right.
So these ideas filter into really two concepts that define the reframing, which is sort of the other part of you know, this talk. Really two concepts, perspective and heuristic. Whoops, let me go back. Perspective is how you look at the problem, right? And heuristic is what you use to try to solve that problem. Your perspective is generally informed, again, by your experiences, by your lived experience, by the things you interact with, right? Common perspectives come from imitation. So if you're mentoring someone and they say, well, you know, you should do it this way, and that's how you've learned, then your perspective of how to solve that problem in the future is based on, right, that experience that you had. It also drives how you end up searching for the solution. And we as human beings always want to try to do things as efficiently and as quickly as possible, which means we want to try to limit as much discomfort as possible. So the groups that we surround ourselves with, the teams, the things, the way that we try to interact with each other, we want to limit that discomfort. So therefore, we have a tendency to surround how we find solutions, right, with things that make us comfortable. Does that make sense? So the desire to conform, right, to not make waves, to look up what has already been looked up, to Google things, all that, that sort of informs how you answer things. So you have your perspective and you have your heuristic. Notwithstanding all the different mental models, notwithstanding what we talked about in terms of shortcuts, and notwithstanding the reality that we all come from different experiences, different things, and we all have these layers of how we define ourselves in a diverse manner. So why is that important? The reason why that's important, especially in open source and especially with as complex as the problems that Drupal tries to solve, anyone think Drupal's really simple? Just curious. Okay. <laughs> Drupal's very, very complex and the, and the kind of things that we're trying to tackle with each other, type of problems that we're trying to solve, especially as knowledge workers, right, trying to solve, the reframing becomes essential to how we become successful, right? This picture sort of shows this, right? On one hand, depending upon where you are, your perspective and how you, what problem you're trying to solve, right, may look completely different than someone else who's literally looking at the same thing and comes from, goes to a completely different conclusion. The essential idea, whoops, what happened? Uh-oh. There we go. The essential idea behind reframing is that the frame through which a person views a situation determines their point of view. When that frame is shifted, the meaning changes, and thinking behavior often change along with it. Let's give a scientific example to kind of bring this home in terms of reframing. So there's a story back in the 1930s. A farmer had a calf, and the calf was sick. And what was making the calf sick is that they were grazing along the land, and they were eating clover. And for those who are, don't have an agricultural background, clover is bad. Like, that kills cows, right? Makes their stomach um, hurt and, and end up bleeding. Um, one of the byproducts, the reason why that is, because one of the byproducts of clover is something called coumarin. And it's actually like a blood thinner. It actually makes um, your blood, your, uh, a, an organic being's blood um, thinner. As this particular farmer was trying to figure out what was causing their calves to be sick, a local scientist, he was claimed as a scientist, he was a self-determined scientist. <laughs> he had come from the insane asylum. <laughs> and he was, especially he was actually in rat poison. He went to go investigate because he knew who this farmer was. Fast forward 40 years later, and coumarin is the key ingredient to coumadin, which, is invent, which was invented as a blood thinner which next to penicillin saved more people's lives, right, than that, than that drug. Why is that important? Because even within science and in terms of innovation, reframing how something can be interacted with, thinking about the effectiveness of something, thinking about the usage of something, changing your perspective, can, you, can lead you to a whole different heuristic, which ultimately leads to innovation, which could have a very broad impact. All right, so when we talk about our framing, what typically drives how we frame things? And it's usually sort of two things inside um, our heads. 
something called IQ and EQ, something you probably have heard many, many times, right? So IQ is our intelligence quotient, and EQ is emotional quotient. IQ is basically your ability to learn, not like what you know, right? So it's the rate for all those physics people, it's more acceleration than velocity sort of thing, right? The rate of how, how fast you can learn something. Whereas EQ is your ability to recognize one's emotions and others. In IQ, it doesn't really change after you're born, right? The rate of how you learn things. Technology is failing me. But EQ changes over time. You can work on it. You can improve it. You can do things, right, to improve and change and really rethink how you interact with others, how you perceive emotions, how you perceive your own emotions. Why is this important? Because the emotional quotient or emotional intelligence within groups have shown, I was gonna click through this because my technology is failing, that many studies have shown that the teams that are more creative and more productive is when they can achieve high, higher levels of participation within the team, right? This idea of mutual trust. So how do you gain mutual trust with each other, right? If you don't feel like you can contribute, if you don't feel like you're listened to, if you feel like someone's emotions or your emotions are constantly sort of at high, right, that degrades the trust, the effectiveness of the team. So there's studies, social science studies behind this that says really group efficacy, right, is based on the emotional quotient of the team. And at the heart of these conditions, right, is the ability to listen. So when we talk again about perspective and bias and our shortcuts and how we think about different things, Right? These are the concepts that ultimately connect to the effectiveness that we have as a community, but also as a team, whether we're working on an issue or whether we're trying to all come together. Come on, technology. All right. For example, when you hear about great groups, what do you hear? Not that the members are really smart, but that they listen to each other. So... That brings us to our first allegorical character in Star Trek Voyager, which is, all right, so I understand these concepts of diversity, and okay, I agree that people come from different perspectives, that's fine. I understand that inside of me I have these shortcuts that I do, and I have these mechanisms, and reframing is good, and perspective, and all that stuff you just said, that's fine. So what is the solution? What are the things that I can be doing? What is the logical next step, right? So who is the person for those who know Star Trek, ultimately, that represents my favorite character, Tuvok, right? As I said before, Tuvok was um, a black Vulcan. He focused on being calm and logical, and, and he was an expert botanist, which is pretty cool. He always tried to keep the peace on the show and in the series through wisdom, experience, and vitality. One of his famous quotes says, on the contrary, the demands on a Vulcan's character are extraordinarily difficult. Do not mistake composure for ease. And so the lesson to take away here is that even though these concepts and in your pursuit to execute some of these ideas, just because you may have to do it in a professional way doesn't mean that it will be easy, especially with teams from diverse backgrounds, lived experience, and different neurodivergencies. However, Let's say you are part of a team, part of an organization, which we all are, right, with all these different perspectives, right? What do these type of diverse teams excel at? That's actually been researched. Here's a book, if you want to really kind of get into it. It's actually written by a complex systems math and economic professor, Dr. Scott Page. And what's really cool about this research is that he revealed that progress and innovation may depend less on lone thinkers with enormous IQs, them diverse people working together and capitalizing on their individuality. Keywords there, capitalizing on their individuality. He even came up with a theorem, diversity trumps ability theorem, but it does have certain some conditions, right? The problem must be hard, like really hard. That cannot be solved by an individual person. Right? Each solver within that problem has to have a local optima to that problem. So basically what that means is that there's experts right, within that particular group, designer, UX, architect, right, account manager, things of that nature. 
an improvement can be made on a non-optimal solution. So as long as there's improvements, constant improvements can be made, right, then this theorem holds true. And last, last but not least, you have to have a large pool of solvers from a decent sized collection, like, I don't know, an open source community, right? Ultimately, what this is sort of reinforcing is reframing our perspective and heuristic within a mathematical context reinforces right, some of the social science things that I presented before. Really what this paper sort of dives into is that a group of diverse problem solvers can outperform groups of high ability problem solvers under the right conditions. For those who really, really, really like math, here's the actual theorem. <laughs> right? And what you're actually looking at is something called the diversity prediction identity. So if you want to Google that, you can. But what you probably have heard this is called is, it's the wisdom of the crowd, right? What you're looking at, I'm gonna say this appropriately because I don't know who the math majors are in the room. The squared error of the collective prediction equals the average squared error minus the predicted diversity. Wisdom of the crowd's research routinely attributes the superior, superiority of crowd averages over individual judgments to the elimination of individual noise an explanation that assumes independence of the individual judgments from each other. All of that jargon basically means the crowd tends to make its best decisions if it is made up of diverse opinions and ideologies. So we've got some social science evidence, we've got some, some math evidence. And I think people still haven't run out screaming, so I think I'm doing an okay job. <laughs> if you really want to check my work, there's some links here on these slides. Again, I'm not trying to fool anybody. There's actually a counter, right? Because there's a research paper and you've got to have counter opinions. So you can do that too. And there's a counter counter to that opinion as well. <laughs> so basically, what does this model, both the social science, social science model and the math models tell us? <clears throat> it basically tells us that we have to think of people almost as like a collection of tools. Their ability is a reflection of the applicability of those tools to a given set of problems. That's really the purpose of forming the mental models. That's how you can leverage the biases and all the other things we sort of talked about in a positive direction. Those are the things that you, if you keep that sort of concept, that's how we get, that is the logical solution. That's how we get to this next phase of our community and the complex things we're trying to solve. Yes, we can subject them for empirical testing but we can also use them to change how we think about the world. What if open source can make a world a better place by requiring equity and emotional intelligence integral to its interoperability? What would that mean? That in order to be successful in this space, successful within our community, not being right, but being successful, successful within your team, your organization, whether you lead the team or you're part of an initiative, that these become the measures and markers of how we define success, especially given the social science evidence and the mathematical evidence. Go back to our mental models, right? Don't need to rehash these, but the what am I missing? Acknowledging there will always be flaws and focusing on being successful sort of give us the light towards those goals. The key, though, is leadership. And that's what Jane represented, right? She was the first female captain. She was bullheaded. She was simultaneously dogmatic and impulsive. She melded together a dynamic crew, including the rebels, as I mentioned before. She was stubborn and bold. And she was curious to dive in. Why does, things, why does that work that way that it works? Her famous saying was, you have to keep your shirt tucked in and go down with the ship and never abandon a member of your crew. Could not abandoning someone also be a form of reframing? Star Trek has always been masterful in their shows of providing context to hard problems. And if you've ever watched one, you'll see that they, whenever there's like a hard problem, there's a character that gives little piece, and there's another character that gives another piece, and there's another character that gives another piece. And so you have the leader sort of try to bring all these different things together and they try to keep an open dialogue to make sure all that information is shared and they try to create a culture because they know that not one individual, even someone as brilliant as 
data, right, can solve every problem. Sorry, I just like crossed different universes there with Star Trek. <laughs> I'm going to get to seven of nine, trust me. I'll, I was trying to save her, but I'll, I'll get to that point. I must have skipped slides because I can't find the one there. Sorry. Yep, my technology failed. Let me go back. Did this part. Oh, no. Mental models. Okay, let's start here. One of the things, the pitfalls that often happens with this that sometimes leaders have happened and everyone kind of gets into is something called the common knowledge effect and basically what that is it's a decision-making bias and it basically assumes that everyone within the team already knows something right what's common knowledge and what was so fascinating about Amy June's keynote yesterday was she hit on this when it came to documentation and having questions and that response being well you could just grab it because that kind of response no, I'm not picking on that person, right? Reinforces that, well, you should already know this part, so I'm going to give the answer based on this common knowledge that I assume everyone knows. <laughs> Another sort of way this rears its head is how evaluations are made, right? How we judge our team members, how we judge each other, right? This should be common knowledge, you should already know this, that type of thing. What I'm really trying to reinforce, again, from these concepts of focusing on being successful and asking what I'm missing, are the constant interrogation and questions we need to ask each other to avoid this thing that typically happens within our groups, this idea that we all just know what is going on and what is happening. One of the things I also kind of encourage, especially new members of the community or folks from underrepresented groups, because I've heard it a lot, is trying to encourage folks to not clarify that they're non-technical. Because I know from talking to different folks, especially women that I know, people from underrepresented groups, new developers that I mentor, they want to try to constantly contextualize themselves saying, well, I'm not really technical, so there's my question. Because I think what ends up happening is they probably had experiences of this particular phenomenon. They assume that when they've asked questions in other places and they don't understand what someone is saying, that the common knowledge that that person is assuming they know that something is wrong with them because they don't know it. And so they clarify and say, well, I'm not this, so therefore can you start from this perspective? And what I ultimately think, especially being in this community for so long, is that that's actually a challenge for those of us who've been here for a long time and those who may have more higher technical acuity from experience, right? That we need to do a better job of making sure that anyone can kind of come to the table and start wherever they start and that our on-ramp is adequate. Usually a telltale sign that one of these things has happened is when we start getting stressed and anxious in terms of speed and efficiency to try to get to the ultimate goal. So when you're focusing on trying to build a culture that pulls in different perspectives and focus on being successful, there are certain pitfalls and things that make this very, very difficult. The first is, this process is not efficient. And as engineers, that's really, really hard. <laughs> we want efficient, quick solutions. We live in a world, right, where growth, expediency, efficiency, outsized returns, that's what's driving a lot of what's happening. It needs to be done yesterday, it needs to be done at a high quality, it needs to be done fast. A lot of this work is not fast. It takes a lot of time, a lot of practice, etc., and it is very difficult. It takes a lot of time and practice, and there will be a lot of mistakes. One of the other things that typically happens, especially when you're around people from different perspectives and different lived experiences, there's going to be miscommunication. It, it's going to happen. Right? Especially within this knowledge work context when we all, most of us work remotely. Right? When you work remotely and you're talking to people via a screen or Slack or email, etc., a lot of context is, is lost. And when you're trying to bring together different perspectives and you're trying to understand very complex things, 
right? Miscommunication will happen, and we try really hard to mitigate some of those things, but we all have to also recognize that it, it's going to happen, and that's, again, putting a lot of stress on our leaders and the people who set the culture within your organization, within our community, within that particular task initiative, to recognize and really speak to these things to make sure everyone's on the same page. We, we recognize this is gonna happen. And the last and that thing is that the other sort of big catch is for folks who believe in these kind of things and who've had a lot of experience being a part of different teams in different circumstances, right? They become very vulnerable because when they spend a lot of time putting these practices in place, trying to have as many conversations as possible, focusing on success, and it doesn't work, and you spend a lot of time trying to do that, those failures hit hard. Those L's are very deep. And share a couple of personal stories where, like, to kind of reinforce what I'm talking about. You know, as I said before, I've been in this industry for 15 plus years. I've worked for a lot of different agencies. Um, some of the ones out there, um, some of the people in this room I've actually worked with, which is great. Um, you know, there was a situation at one point in time um, where I was working on a team, I was asked to be part of a team, and um, the big difficulty of that team was that the product owner wasn't, um, didn't really understand Drupal, and they, they were just kind of new to it, but they knew that their responsibility was to move from the existing AEM system to, to Drupal. And so when I was part of that team for about a year, I really focused on trying to understand how to get to success. What were the markers? And a lot of it wasn't technical, it was actually sort of psychological vulnerability stuff, right? So I would spend after hours talking to the product owner, I would talk to the different developers, I would talk to the manager and try to figure out what's going on and I would make presentations and try to, you know, put things in certain language and the authors and the different department people who were actually using the particular system, I would try to make that bridge. And I spent a lot of time trying to unearth sort of the underlying issues of whatever it was that was causing them to spend inordinate amounts of money to try to ultimately get to their goal. <laughs> and ultimately came down to the fact that just a few people who were in decision makings and were gatekeeping were just insecure. They just didn't understand the technology. They weren't really comfortable saying that they didn't really understand it. And it, it took a lot of time, you know, for me to, to kind of work with them. And it was great. They ended up, you know, kind of figuring out. I was really happy with, with, with my, um, with, with the effort that we put in. And towards the end of that project, um, you know, I was, I was really stressed out. I had been a lot of anxiety and I wanted to take a break. And I sort of told the manager, I said, okay, you know, um, the contract's up for renewal in about a month. You know, I, sorry, um, I plan to roll off and you take a break. And, you know, that's, that's fine. Okay, that's great. You know, good job. You know, thank you for all your help, etc. And as soon as the contract was over and I said my goodbyes, I ended up getting a bunch of backdoor channels from, um, from LinkedIn, basically saying, hey, once you left, that manager just talked about you like a dog, like it was, they just felt betrayed, they said that you put all this time in, and now they just felt like, you know, you just kind of abandoned them, etc. And it really hurt. It just, it just really sucked, because I thought I did a good job, you know, we as a team thought we did a good job trying to help them, but, you know, things happen. Fast forward to another example, where I was part of a team, and because of that experience, I took a completely different approach. I was part of that team, I tried to really, really focus on just getting the work done, focus on the technical solutions. I was president you know, on all of the meetings, I tried to just try to be a part of the team, but I didn't really want to get too deep into it because of the previous experience, right? And if over a year, you know, our team did a really good job, you know, we solved a lot of problems, we helped this organization and this team sort of move forward and um, helped unstick certain things and just, I just really worked really, really hard and tried to you know, get as many things done as possible. What I learned later, unfortunately, was that after that contract ended, um, unexpectedly, I ended up getting feedback later that the reason why it had ended was not because that the work that we had done was poor, was because that I didn't put more energy in trying to be a team lead and trying to be a senior dev and trying to be more engaged and trying, and so again, from their perspective, I completely understand you know, where that's coming from, something I didn't really think about, but obviously from my perspective, given the previous experience, right, I went into a completely different situation. Why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because, again, this type of work is very difficult, right? This community and the things that we're doing are very difficult, and so I just wanna make sure, <laughs> after doing this and kind of living this experience and, and trying really hard over the last 15 years 
to impress upon these ideas within our community, right, that this is not for the faint of heart, but it is rewarding at the end. For every one maybe poor experience, you know, we've had 10 to 15 awesome experiences and people, you know, continue to engage us and continue to engage me and we, we move forward. But mistakes will happen and things will happen and, you know, you just have to kind of roll with it. Of all the ones and situations that I've been in where there has been a miscommunication or has been a failure or there's been some sort of thing that has happened, there's usually one common pitfall that I've seen every single time. And this pitfall is usually called Hanlon's Razor. Has anyone heard this before? You know what this is? It's a rule of thumb. Basically the rule of thumb for Hanlon's Razor is when something happens that you don't intend and it's bad, you assume nefarious intent, right? You assume that the reason it happened was because someone or something was doing it on purpose to try to hurt the situation, right? And typically when you see that, you know, you may get feedback like, hey, you betrayed or you lied or you, you know, weren't paying attention or you were lazy or, or things of that nature, right? When those kind of comments come out, that's usually where that other sort of shortcut sort of comes in. And that, again, kind of comes down to miscommunication. It comes down to a different perspective, it comes down to maybe a, a lived experience of that person, and when something doesn't happen that they expect, that's the sort of thing that, I don't, you know, that, that's a possibility. And if you look it up, the quote is usually, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by a mistake. All right, so given those two personal stories I gave you, right, the mistake was, on the first one, okay, maybe I should have communicated more the full plan versus waiting to the last month to say, hey, this is what I'm planning to do, and this is what I've been doing. Maybe I could have done a little bit better job explaining all the extra hours I had done to try to get to the point that we were. In that second situation, right, the mistake that I made was maybe I need to do a better job of communicating my days and my weeks. We need to communicate, right, especially getting remotely, remember talk about the miscommunication and all these different perspectives, right, that extra step of writing and being transparent. Maybe that's the mistake that I made. All right, almost done. So, in conclusion, to solve difficult problems, we have to think of people and their abilities as almost like a set of tools, right? And diversity really is just the distinctness of that tool. If you've ever seen a master carpenter's toolbox, it is like the craziest thing you've ever seen, right? Some of you may have hammers and flathead screwdriver, et cetera, but you ever get a map, like there are just like these tools that just do this very, very, very specific one thing, right? And that's, that diversity of all their tool sets kind of gets them to ultimately to that job. To effectively collaborate, we need leaders, right? And everyone in here is a leader, whether you're a leader of a team, an organization, an initiative, a problem, a task, a project, et cetera, right? We need our leaders and our community members to nurture, emotional, nurture emotional intelligence and constantly reframe their perspective, right? Use our mental models. Foster a culture of transparency. As I mentioned before, one of the things that, I've, that we do in our organization all the time is write things down, especially remotely, right? Before we have meetings, before I have any kind of feedback, before even I, you know, find a jump into some of these biases, right? Oh, this person didn't respond right away. What were they doing? I have to take a step back. I'm gonna write down my thoughts first, right? And I wanna make sure I write them down so that I have a coherent way to communicate. I send that to them ahead of time so that they can read it, they can reply, and then when we talk about it, right, we're talking about our understanding of what was written. I ultimately believe these things are critical to the success of our community. As I said before, I've spoken on these topics for years. I've seen firsthand, especially when coming into an existing project or a team, these kind of concepts are vital. If you believe in these similar ideas and are you know, working on different things, definitely reach out to me and, and let's collaborate. Let's try to do something together. I'd love to work with you. Like with any kind of science and math and things that I presented, I want to give you all the sources of where I got this information so you know I'm legitimate. But thank you again for listening. I appreciate it. Is that it? Questions, anyone? Oh, one. Cool. Uh, just a general question. What happened to seven of nine? <laughs> <laughs>
she was on this slide system, but I don't know what happened. My technology was failing and I was running out of time. Let me see if I can find it. Yep, didn't get it to Bellana, there she is. Yeah, somehow I missed all of this information and I don't know what happened to my, to my slide. But basically what I was going to say was that 709 really represents this idea that all the information I just presented to you is relevant, right? Because she, was, she came from a board perspective, she was focused on solving the task. And the, the downside from that perspective right, is that sometimes our understanding of what the solutions are can be missed. And the example I'm kind of giving here, these all do the same thing. The first one was actually designed by a human being. The second one was designed by an artificial intelligence. And the third one was designed by even more supreme artificial intelligence. Can anyone tell me what these things are? Kind of, if you look at the notes, you can kind of see it down there, but it's a carabiner, right? And what this represents is this idea that absence of context and absence of reframing different things, the solution may actually solve the problem. Like the one on the, on the, the, one on the farthest right is actually 50% lighter than the one in the middle, and the one in the middle is 75% lighter than the one on the left. But if you gave a human being <laughs> the one on the right and said, hey, put your life on the line for this Caribbean that I just made with this artificial intelligence, right? Mm, not sure if they would do that. So I apologize for skipping over. I literally have no idea what happened to my slide, so. But she was in there. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. So uh, I think it's apparent that having a team that's inclusive, that invites uh, variants of opinions and analyzes them is great for the dynamics of the team and from What's the approach when the opposite of a dysfunctional team produces that? Three quick examples, Harvey Specter on suits, uh, uh, Michael Jordan and Scotty Pittman and Steve Jobs. Yeah, that's a great question. So for those who didn't hear the question, uh, and I'll rephrase, what are some of the attributes of a, maybe a dysfunctional team? So I've, I've kind of presented all these ideas of like, hey, diverse teams, and this is what you do when you talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera, and context and reframing perspective. What are some attributes of a dysfunctional team? Is that kind of what your question was? Okay. So, and he gave examples. He gave Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen. He gave someone from Suits, Harvey, someone, and then he gave Steve Jobs and Apple. And I think, I think the, what's great about those examples, which kind of goes back to what I put in the presentation, is what is the priority of that team? Right? If winning at all costs, making money at all costs, efficiency at all costs, right? being the best and saying, no, this is what it's going to be at all costs, if those are the priorities of the organization, then that's how you sort of get this, well, I don't really care about all these different perspectives. I just need people to align to this vision that I have, and you're going to do it this way. right? I'll take the Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen one, because I'm from Chicago, that's where I flew in from. Right? Quick side note, I actually was born in Bethesda, but this is my first time actually living here, so. <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day. But like, right, if you talk to people who were, you know, play with Michael Jordan, he was an asshole. Like, a tremendous asshole, right? But they'll never, but they were like, but I want to win a ring at all costs, so I will deal with this pain no matter what happens because I want this ultimate objective. So I think to answer your question, the sign or the, the characteristics of a quote unquote dysfunctional team is when the priorities of whatever the goal is is more aligned to being right of a single person and saying this is what we need to do and you are right, we're going to do this versus the priorities of okay, the goal is to make sure that all members of our team and the people we wanna bring in, the culture we wanna build, we want them to feel like they can contribute and in sports, that's kind of hard because it's a results-oriented thing. If you don't win, you get fired, right? I'm kind of glad I don't like work in sports because that would, that would just be a nightmare, to be quite honest. <laughs> that's why I like open source, why I like Drupal, right? A lot of the projects that I've been part of, a lot of the teams I've part of, we prioritize, okay, 
yeah, we want to hit certain markers, we want to hit certain deadlines, but maybe we should change the scope of what we're going to accomplish before the deadline hits because we want to make sure that we're bringing along different department heads, different authors, different developers, different team members to make sure they're all bought in. Because in a long-term perspective, because we know this project is going to be long tail, we're going to have to upgrade Drupal 7 and Drupal 9 and Drupal 10 and et cetera, et cetera, right? We can't just push through and say, we have to do it this way, this is the right way, et cetera. So I think, I think it's really the organization priorities and then you'll see, right, the burnout. You'll see the kind of long meetings, edicts, stuff like that, versus does someone take the time to write it out? Is it, of the things that are written out, and people's opinions that are written out, are they sent out before the meeting so everyone can kind of digest it? Stuff like that. Does that answer your question? Thank you for the question, I appreciate it. You all have a great day, thanks again.